Greetings to you from Phoenix, Arizona on this warm June 2016 day. This is Tony E. Denton coming to you from my office here. I thank you for joining me in this little audio. And in this particular talk, I'd like to discuss the Holy Spirit's work after all things fulfilled in the events of AD 70. This is obviously a talk that's going to be for those who already believe in fulfilled prophecy or fulfilled eschatology per Luke 21 verse 22. So if you don't already believe all prophecy has been fulfilled like Jesus indicated in Luke 21 22 around the events of the destruction of Jerusalem and Judaism, then this won't make a whole lot of sense to you. And so I tell you right now, just be better for you probably to find another audio or study notes on my website dealing with things like Matthew 16, 27, 28, or the various time statements in reference to eschatology and so on. So if you are already a preterist, someone who believes in past fulfillment of all things, like 1 Peter 4, 7 speaks about and so on, then this topic should be of interest to you, in part because it's a question that floats around a lot among those who believe in fulfilled prophecy. They want to know what the Spirit's work was and or is and if it still continues today and so on. So especially since I have my studies on like 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 12 and Ephesians 4, 7 through 13 on my website. This sort of fits in with that. Those two passages deal with spiritual gifts when they were intended to be in existence and the purpose of them and so on. And this fits into that category, so that's one reason I'm going ahead and doing an audio on this subject as well. So let's talk about the Holy Spirit post AD 70. In order to begin a consideration of the subject of the Spirit after the consummation of all things at AD 70, It only seems logical that we begin by consulting Old Covenant prophecies concerning the Spirit's work in relation to that consummation. We already know that around 928 B.C., God's Old Covenant people Israel, comprising 12 tribes, had split into two chief factions. Ten tribes, retaining the name Israel, became a northern kingdom, and two tribes, becoming known as Judah, became the southern kingdom, the one to remain in Jerusalem. Just check out 1 Kings chapter 12. Eventually, ten tribes of Israel, some people call them the lost ten tribes, became swallowed up among the Gentiles. According to Hosea 8 and verse 8, you can find that there where God talks about that, that they would become swallowed up. And that was all part of God's plan, according to Ezekiel 20 verse 23. See, by the time of the Apostle Paul, the ten tribes had been separated from Judah, and God's generic kingdom at the time for 700 plus years. So they had plenty of time to become assimilated into or swallowed up by the Gentile empire or Gentile world. So to the prophet Ezekiel, mainly in chapters 36 through 39, God promised to ultimately recombine and thus revive these tribes by drawing out the remnant of his faithful from among the pagan nations with the gospel, which, as he knew, would also bring out from among those nations others interested in this Messiah of the Jews. So check out Matthew 13, 24 through 30 in reference to that. In fact, I have a study also on my website and an audio with it on Matthew 13, 36 through 43, which is Jesus' explanation of the parable of Matthew 13, 24 and following, and it deals with some of this. Anyway, this then, of course, led to the fulfillment of the prophecies concerning God's salvation as ultimately including those, the non-Israelite Gentiles, who had never previously been his people. A passage that brings this all together is Isaiah 49, verse 6, in which God said to his son, It is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. A passage that no doubt Simeon had in mind when at Jesus' circumcision ceremony he prophesied of Christ's destiny. Okay, so again, the point I'm making here is simply this. The ten tribes 
the larger portion of Israel, separated from Judah and spread themselves eventually over generations of time throughout the Gentile world of that part of the globe. And they became swallowed up and mixed in with the Gentiles. So that's why by the time of the Apostle Paul, there are those that we refer to as Israelite Gentiles and non-Israelite Gentiles because that's how mixed into the people they were. So you'd have synagogues throughout all of the Roman Empire because of all the Israelites who were all, th- all over the place, you know, outside of the land of Judah. Now, more specifically, from Ezekiel chapters 36 through 39, we can extract the following concerning the method by which God said he would accomplish this task of breathing life into Israel as a whole. Again, bringing the remnant out from among all of Israel's 12 tribes together into one as a brand new body. In Ezekiel 36:27, God prophesied to his people, I will put my spirit within you. In 37 and verse 14, the familiar chapter about the dry bones returning to life has God repeating, I will put my spirit within you and you shall live. Then in chapter 39 verse 29, it has God similarly saying to Ezekiel about his renewed people, I will not hide my face anymore from them when I pour out my spirit upon them. Okay, so in these chapters of Ezekiel, God is talking about bringing the two sticks back together the stick of Ephraim, stick of Judah, and so on, bringing them back together and creating from the remnant of all 12 tribes a new body, a new Israel, a new spiritual Israel, the bride of Christ, the spouse of Christ, by the time it's all said and done, okay? And this would include, sort of indirectly, as a bonus, non-Israelite Gentiles from the work of the Apostle Paul among those people. So it was part of God's plan. Having the Israelites mixed in with Gentiles brought salvation to all of them, all peoples, all nations. But the focus for that last generation of the existence of Israel as a nation was the remnant of Israel. And then through them, after all was said and done, then the Gentile world as a whole became more of a focus. Notice a couple of very interesting points in these verses that is Ezekiel 36:27, Ezekiel 37:14, Ezekiel 39:29. Firstly, as already emphasized, the spirit from a word also meaning breath, as in the breath of life, Genesis 2, was to breathe life into God's new true Israel, a concept that's supported in various New Testament scriptures. Galatians 6 and 8 and 2 Corinthians 3, 6 respectively speak of the spirit as being the provider of eternal life by means of the new covenant. Romans 8, 10, and 11 speak of the spirit of life that was in those first generation Christians to give them life. Most significant though is Romans 8, 23. Here Paul said to them that they possess the spirit for the redemption or per verse 11, we could even say the resurrection, of their body. Notice that singular. One of my favorite studies that's on my website is Romans 8, uh, 18 through 23. So look for that one, and it will help explain some of this even further. Romans 8, 18 through 23, where it talks there about the creation and the spirit giving life to the creation, giving redemption to the creation and the new body and so on. So, the Spirit was given to give life to the remnant who had accepted Jesus as the Christ. For those who did not accept Jesus as the Messiah, they were not given life. Those Israelites died. No hope. But the Israelites who did accept became the remnant and were given life by the Spirit that was breathing life into them during the time when they were in the Old Covenant but were coming out of it. By coming out of it, they were being given life. Okay, the second interesting point related to these verses in Ezekiel is by fulfilling this task of providing life for the new covenant body of Christ, for his bride, God would then be able to face his people again. Chapter 39, verse 29 of Ezekiel. He would be able to face them again. What's the significance of that? Well, giving life is equal with reconciling, which means making friends again with the members of that body to God. And reconciling two parties is synonymous with bringing them back together in a face-to-face relationship. 
Now, I spent a lot of time on this face-to-face concept in my study on 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 12, so I ask you to check that out. But for now, uh, we'll say a few things here. When David became angry with his son Absalom for murdering Amnon, David's words to Joab of severing his relationship with Absalom were, Don't let him see my face. Or as another version reads, He must never come into my presence. 2 Samuel 14, 24. Later, when he desired forgiveness, Absalom said to Joab, Let me see the king's face. But if there is iniquity in me, let him execute me. Verse 32 implying he'd rather die than remain out of fellowship with his father. The relationship between Yahweh and Moses was spoken of in the same way. In Exodus 33, verse 11, it doesn't just say the Lord spoke to Moses, but that the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Likewise, when David desired a closer relationship with Yahweh, one that involved forgiveness, he said to him, When you said, Seek my face, my heart said to you, Your face, Lord, I will seek. Psalm 27, verse 8. And most significant in this vein for us post-70 AD is Revelation 22, 4, in which John, when writing about the consummated kingdom, spoke of the new covenant people as seeing God's face. It's a very important concept, this whole eye-to-eye, mouth-to-mouth, face-to-face concept. It's a very covenantal idea of reconciliation between two parties. So that's what God in Ezekiel was dealing with, was by giving the Spirit and by that Spirit breathing life into those who accepted his Son as Messiah, he was remedying things, restoring things to the point that he could then again have a face-to-face relationship with Israel, that is, the remnant of Israel who became his new covenant people. So according to Ezekiel, the Spirit's task was to provide life which meant he would repair man's relationship to his creator, bringing him face to face. Now, let's try to bring all this a little closer home by considering New Testament passages which help us understand when the Spirit fulfilled his God-appointed task. In Acts chapter 2, 16 and following, we find the inspired apostle Peter echoing Joel 2, 28 through 32, which correlates perfectly to Ezekiel 36, 27, 37, 14, and 39, 29. Joel says it shall come to pass afterward, or as Peter said, in the last days, that I will pour out my spirit in those days, and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And what was it that Peter said in Acts 2.16 about these prophecies concerning the events of Acts chapter 2? He said, This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, going on with his quote of Joel 2.28-32, which parallels the thoughts contained in chapters 36-39 through of Ezekiel. You could look at Joel 2, in fact, that passage as sort of being a summary of what's talked about in Ezekiel. So between what points in time did this Peter-quoted prophecy of Joel place the beginning and ending of the Spirit's work? The Spirit's work that was being poured out for the purpose of destroying one set of heavens and earth and bringing in another set of heavens and earth in Acts chapter 2 before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. Between what times did Peter put that? He put it between AD 30 and Pentecost and AD 70, the Holocaust, right there in Acts 2, 16 and following. And what was the purpose? To create an open invitation to anyone of any nation to call upon the name of the Lord for salvation life, Acts 2, 21. So the promised work of the Spirit, along with whatever means he utilized to fulfill it, was to be, and as we'll see, was finished at the time of the judgmental destruction of Jerusalem. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 4 through 8, talks about the Spirit's work, especially in relation to his provision of supernatural gifts, and that they would confirm those people until the day of the Lord. Now notice I said promised Spirit. Why? Because as Jesus said in Acts 1 verse 4, the giving of the Spirit, as noted in Ezekiel, was a promise of the Father. In fact, according to Paul, The Spirit and His work were God's pledge that the finished work of the Spirit, that is, redemption in the temple of reconciliation, would indeed come to fruition. 
To some first-generation Christians, Ephesians chapter 1, 13 and 14, Paul said, You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, and that this Spirit was their guarantee, or as some versions say, pledge of their inheritance until the redemption or the inheritance. Okay, there it is. Paul places the work of the Spirit as being that which was there for the purpose of guaranteeing them, that is the remnant that was coming out of Israel and all those who before Christ came had accepted him as Messiah, the Spirit's pledge to them was that they would be included in the bride he would marry. Let's consider a couple words in this passage of Ephesians chapter 1, 13 and 14. Paul chose a preposition, eis, E-I-S, when he wrote that they were sealed with the Spirit until, eis, the redemption. This term refers to the action of finally attaining to a goal, that is, coming into possession of an objective place, purpose, or position. Thayer's lexicon says it refers to an entrance into something. Even choosing the word limit as part of its definition to indicate that this something is the aim or purpose or goal of the word ice. So the Spirit's purpose, according to Paul, was to guarantee them to be their pledge that they would be the ones to enter into and receive the redemption and inheritance, thereby being, as he goes on in chapter 5 of Ephesians, making them the bride that would be married in AD 70. The bride would be married in AD 70. Once the old bride was destroyed, the new bride could be married. Right after the old one was destroyed, not 2,000 years of betrothal period. Interestingly, the original term for pledge in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 is Erebon, and is found only three times in the entire New Testament scriptures, and every time it's by Paul and in connection with the Spirit. Ephesians 1, 14, 2 Corinthians 1, 22, and 2 Corinthians 5, verse 5. And incidentally, I have a study on 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 8, also on my website, that you could even go to that and read it or listen to it and see some connections made. The only other place it can be found in Greek scripture is in the Septuagint, or the Greek Old Testament of Genesis 38, 17 through 20, in which it was used to describe something provided as a security slash substitute until the actual payment was provided, at which time the pledge was returned. Okay, check that out. Read Genesis 38, 17 through 20. The only other place where this word is found, and notice how it's used. Again, it's used to describe something provided as a security or substitute until the actual payment was provided, at which time the pledge was returned. So, if we merely allow the Bible to define and explain itself, then all we're left with is that the Spirit returned to God, who gave him once his work was finished. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. His work was to pledge them as God's people, the new covenant bride. Later, after Paul spent some time in Ephesians chapter 2, 19 through 22, teaching those first-generation brethren about their being built into a holy temple in the Lord by the Spirit. In chapter 4, verse 30, he cautioned them to not grieve the Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed, ice, for ice, the day of redemption. There it is again, same concept. In Romans eight sixteen, he taught some other first-generation Christians that the Spirit with whom they were sealed expressed that sealing by bearing witness to them that they were the children of God. How? Through the auspices of miracles, supernatural gifts, and so on. 1 Corinthians 1, 4 through 8. Also, check out Revelation 7, 3 and Revelation 14, verse 1 with reference to this. Now, with all of these thoughts behind us, there's an obvious implication we must deal with, namely that the gifts of the Spirit by which he accomplished this work have thus ceased at the end of that 40-year period, something which was actually prophesied in Micah 7.15, where it has God speaking and saying, as in the days when you, Israel, came out of Egypt, that is, that 40-year wilderness period, I will show them, the first century peoples, wonders. See the parallel? Just like he showed wonders during that 40-year period getting into Canaan with the shoes not wearing out and the manna from heaven and all that. 
he said, and I'm going to do the same thing in the 40-year period that leads into the new covenant, Canaan, Micah 7.15. It's really interesting how that all just parallels and fits together and allows the Bible to explain the Bible. And this corresponds perfectly with the teaching of Paul, 1 Corinthians 1, 4 through 8, 13, 8 through 10, and Ephesians 4, 7 through 13, which is ironically in the context of the Spirit's work, as I noted earlier. Now, even with all that said, it's important that we still speak more directly to the idea of the Spirit post AD 70, that is, after Jerusalem's demise, the Spirit in reference to us today. And there are some passages which are relevant to that. The very temple that the Spirit finished building for God, Christ, and us was given its life by the Spirit, which to me means that this temple can never be devoid of that which gives it life. After all, a body without its spirit is dead, right? In Romans fourteen seventeen, we find Paul saying of this Spirit-built temple that the kingdom of God is not food and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. To me, implying that this kingdom could not possess its righteousness and peace and joy without its life giver, the Spirit. Besides, we have the following passages, which would be difficult to understand if the Spirit just disappeared from the scene altogether once his creation work had been accomplished. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Hebrews 3, 7 and following teaches that the Spirit speaks through the Word, which corresponds to the combining of Ephesians 5, 18 and 19 with its sister passage in Colossians 3, 16. And lastly, there's Matthew 12, 32, where Jesus said, Whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him either in this age, that is the Old Covenant age, or in the age to come, that is the New Covenant age. Why would Jesus say this if the Spirit disappeared completely from the scene post AD 70? So, what's the work of the Spirit post AD 70? Well, we might as well ask, what's the work of God post AD 70? I'm not so sure we don't answer one if we answer the other. Isn't it enough to just know that the Spirit, being the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ, finished His work and is essentially sitting on the throne with the Father and Son, or as part of the Father and Son, perhaps even being pictured as the life-giving water flowing from that throne in Revelation 22, verse 1. So the main thing we can see in what I've said here today about the Spirit post AD 70 especially how this fits with 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 12 and Ephesians 4, 7 through 13, is that the Spirit's primary work was to essentially create the bride for Christ to marry. And since the union was created at AD 70 between Christ and the bride, we are children now of that union. And so we have the Spirit's work done at the creation of the union. The Spirit used the miracles as the predominant factor in accomplishing that task, giving them encouragement and abilities to do things and to say things they couldn't otherwise do. And that was their pledge, that they were God's people. So once the wedding occurred, there was no more purpose in the Spirit continuing that work. Now, He is simply there, right along with the Father and the Son, on the throne, giving out that constant life-giving water from the throne. So, thank you for your time, and I hope that helps a little bit with my understanding of the Spirit post AD 70 and understanding of at least half the preterist people I know, I could probably say most whom I know, agree with this concept. The only ones who don't agree are those who also believe in the charismata and miracles continuing to exist post AD 70. And that's consistent. If you're going to believe the miracles continue to exist, then you're going to continue to believe that the Spirit continues some supernatural work post AD 70. But to me, it's very inconsistent to believe that all things are fulfilled and at the same time believe the miracles that were to bring in the fulfillment are still continuing. That implies that the work was not done and has not been done. Anyway, again, thanks for your time and uh, see you on the flip side.